This week we continue our sermon series on the pastoral principles. If you missed the first two, uh, you can check them out uh, on our YouTube channel uh, for, on our website. This week we're continuing the sermon series with speaking into silence and Ian is speaking to us about the importance of breaking silence in order to bring justice, reflecting on a passage from Esther. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the Edict for Annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence, to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for some of these stories and the things that we can learn from them. Thank you particularly for Esther's courage. And we ask now that you will help us to uh, listen to what it is you have to say to us this morning. Amen. So one of the things that um, I observed during the 25 years that I travelled across the nations of Africa is that trying to silence opposition never really works for the long term. It might have short term results, but it never works in the long term. Africa has seen its fair share of oppressive leaders and uh, they have all sought to try and silence anyone who didn't agree with them. They prefer to try and create the pretense that the critics weren't there and, and, or didn't exist at all and that everything in their nation was lovely. I think that was often born out of a sense of insecurity, but 
what happened is it created a, an unhealthy and dangerous environment because it meant that there were never any checks made when there were errors of judgment. And I think it's possible to chart the decline of many regimes that were well-meaning at first and started well, but which unraveled into a morass of corruption and cruelty. And actually we can see the same thing happening in um, Iran this very week over the elections and the sidelining of, I think it was over 600 people, opposition people who put their names forward for election and uh, uh, lo and behold, the only one who's really emerged is the, an ultra-conservative um, uh, uh, imam from uh, the, uh, the regime. So that's what happens on one side. But on the other hand, there are leaders who allow debate, who listen to criticism, and who, I think, often avoid those pitfalls and mature into wise and benevolent leaders of an open and thriving society. I think the same thing can happen in families, actually, particularly with fathers who see themselves very much as the authority figure. They can become controlling, coercive, and even violent if their authority, or if they feel that their authority is being threatened. That is fatherhood at its very worst. But on the flip side, I personally was blessed with a wonderful father who was always interested in my views and what I had to say. He encouraged family discussion. To, to, so excuse me. <coughs> he encouraged family discussion to ensure that we were all secure and happy and that we all felt that our voices were being heard. Today's Bible reading from the book of Esther shows that when evil is on the march, there comes a time when it is imperative to speak up, where the silencing of criticism just won't do. There's a famous quotation that is attributed to William Burke, although there is some controversy about that, but the quotation says that all that it takes for evil to flourish is that good men do nothing. And we could add, or say nothing. In the aftermath of World War II, the Lutheran and Catholic churches in Germany bitterly regretted staying silent in the face of Hitler's oppressive policies. There were some brave people who did speak out, for example, Martin Niermuller and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and some paid with their lives, as Esther feared that she might. But I believe that their courage helped to bring the evil that was happening in Germany to public attention and may have contributed in some part to the eventual downfall of the Nazi regime. In our reading, we see a change happening in Esther. She started from the position that it was just easier to keep quiet. I'm sure we all know that position. I often think when I come across difficult, it's, oh, it'd just be easier to keep quiet, wouldn't it? The difference is that in Esther's case, she rightly feared for her life. But eventually she saw that silence was not the answer, that something had to be said, and her speaking out saved her people. The pastoral principle we're looking at today requires us to speak into silence. And the supporting document says this, central to our understanding of the Christian community is that we are the body of Christ. We are called to relate deeply and openly with one another, sharing what is on our hearts as well as in our minds. We live and work together, offering and using our God-given gifts, blessings, insights and experiences. I think within the church there is a real danger that we spiritualise silence as something holy. Certainly there can be moments when silence can be very special and we can feel a closeness to God in that moment. 
But silence is definitely not holy when it's used as a tool of oppression. So as I explained two weeks ago in the introduction to these pastoral principles, they have come out of and are, are in a sense, informing the discussion within the church at the moment about uh, what our position should be going forward, recognising the concerns of the LGBTI plus community. And it's wrong to ignore the presence and concerns of LGBTI people, as if those people of, of that orientation don't somehow exist in the church. They do. Silence, when it's misused, can shelter abuses of power. People must be given space, permission and opportunity to speak. And if we do so, we will be fulfilling the principle of speaking into silence. Now I have to confess that we have not talked enough about these issues in the past and I regard myself as, as, as partly responsible for that. But that's something we want to address as we go through the autumn. Um, the ministry team will be leading us through this process of exploring some of the issues so that we can hear and listen to one another. We may not be able to reach agreement. In fact, I think that's quite likely. But silence is not the answer. We must avoid the collective conspiracy of silence simply because that's the easiest option. Maintaining a pretense that the problem doesn't exist and that therefore the people do not exist is not a solution to the problem and is oppressive. It forces the problem under, underground into darkness, but it will always erupt again. So, we're called to speak into silence. And in that context, I have to say that I... I consider it equally wrong on both sides of the debate, equally wrong for the transgender lobby to try to silence those like J.K. Rowling who hold a different viewpoint, as it is for those who hold that different viewpoint to attempt to silence or marginalise transgender people. We need to talk about these things, we need to be able to discuss these issues openly, to listen to one another with an attitude of mutual respect as King Xerxes did to Esther when she courageously ventured into his presence. We need to find a way to disagree well at those points where we cannot find agreement. That, I believe, is what any good father would want for his family. And that, I believe, is what God wants of us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we recognise that in your church we have often found it easier to ignore and stay silent about uh, issues of concern to people, and that that has not been the most helpful response. Lord, help us to uh, speak into silence and to listen to one another so that concerns can be properly aired and we can seek a way forward together. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we reflect on that reading and uh, my thoughts that have followed on it, we're going to listen to a, a song now that is based on two parts of Scripture, really. Firstly on uh, Psalm 82 and then also on Isaiah 1, 17, where God encourages us to speak out on behalf of the, the poor and the oppressed, to defend those who are marginalised. It's a song called, I Will Speak Out for Those Who Have No Voices. If you would like to stand, please do feel free to stand. Mm -hmm. 